I am now pleased to introduce my colleague and friend, Aerial Services Geospatial Solutions Consultant on the East Coast, Roy Hill, who will share his expert knowledge with you today. Roy has over a decade of experience in the geospatial profession with two decades experience consulting to make clients' lives easier. His current roles include handling project design, estimation, contract negotiations, and collaborating with operations. He also assists with company marketing, business development, and regularly attends regional and national trade shows representing aerial services. Roy has presented all over the world on business and technical topics, including radar grammetry, the evolution, advanced feature extraction and class classification, and land cover and land use mapping. Today, Roy is planning on sharing his tips and tricks to allow you to maximize your next geospatial project. So without further ado, I'll pass the baton to Roy. Roy? Unmuted. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. As Joshua said, my name is Roy Hill, and I'm a geospatial solutions manager with Aerial Services. And today I'm presenting on key points to maximize your geospatial data project. This presentation is more philosophy and general based rather than technical and detail based. I intentionally did this because today's audience has a wide range of experience, knowledge, and understanding of geospatial remote sensing, as well as different levels of access to both internal and external consultants. Because of this wide variety among you, the intention of this presentation is to provide you general guidance and to encourage you to think out of the box when developing a geospatial project. Geospatial remote sensing technology consistently experiences advancements in hardware, software, and best practices, often making it impractical to remain up to date and follow the latest trends, which can be daunting and intimidating. This presentation will briefly highlight some key points so that your consultation will result in the best value, information, and solution for drafting a request for proposal so your geospatial project will be successful. With that said, I'll address what is a geospatial consultant and how to use collaboration to your advantage. I'll discuss how project tolerances and specifications can affect pricing and a few warnings when requesting a negotiating price. I'll also provide suggestions on some criteria to help you select the correct and most qualified geospatial firm for your project and organization. So what geospatial consultant? You may have heard of a geospatial consultant, but you may not know specifically what a geospatial consultant does or how fully how to fully use them to your advantage. After you understand what you should realistically expect from one, you need to know when to engage them and where best to contact a consultant. A geospatial consultant is really a person who works with you to ensure your mapping objectives are achieved, beginning with the initial concept to final delivery and application. They develop geospatial solutions to your problems through the use of remote sensing technologies and associated services. Uh, but keep in mind that not all consultants, including myself, specialize in all things geospatial. Some specialize in ground-based or airborne remote sensing. Others specialize in GIS. Some work only from satellite imagery. And some are just generalists. Now, I'm not implying that one consultant or firm cannot manage related disciplines outside their specialty area. However, it is important to ensure the consultant has experience in the areas needed for your project. A geospatial consultant can help you by providing, by providing a means to bring the spatial world to your desktop so that you can make the best and most accurate decisions using evidence-based industry stand, best standards and practices, and using their knowledge of future industry trends. A consultant will have a team of experienced professionals supporting them in order to develop the best solution for your project. Just like you have a team 
you rely on, so does a geospatial consultant. It is my opinion it's best to contact a consultant in the conceptual or planning stages to ensure you understand the latest available technological advancements and capabilities. So you get a more comprehensive and current solution when drafting an RFP or designing your project. This could easily take a year or more before the procurement is released and so that budgets can be more accurately developed. So depending on your organization, you can find a consultant either internally or through a geospatial firm or even a network of state, regional, and national associations who maintain such a list. You can ask around through your personal network on who has used geospatial consultants or firms and, and use their references. Generally, a geospatial firm will not charge a fee for a no-obligation consultation. There are some purely independent consultants who make it their business to not be directly or exclusively associated with any one geospatial firm, and they tend to charge a fee. These independent consultants are often viewed as being unbiased and offer objective reviews during the contractor selection process. They maintain an intimate knowledge of the most trusted firms who could respond to a single or even a multi-participant geospatial project. Regardless, most consultants, whether they're independent or associated with a geospatial firm, they view themselves as an advocate for the industry and will and should focus on what is best for you and your project objectives. So now that we know what a geospatial consultant does, where to find one, and what to expect from them, I believe one of the important aspects of utilizing a geospatial consultant is to bring them into the collaboration process. I feel the collaboration process is critical to any successful project. Collaboration with both internal and even external stakeholders will ensure that the intentions of the project are achieved. Intentions are not always evident in what you ask for, so that's why it's important to discuss with all stakeholders, both internally and externally. Often I've seen an RFP that doesn't effectively communicate the true goal of a project which results in a client receiving what they asked for rather than what they needed. So what are some ways you can avoid this situation? I think the first and important is to understand as a data owner and user what the intended use of the data will be. And consider other potential stakeholders who may benefit from the data so that their needs can be considered when developing a scope. Another often overlooked potential of a project is the data remining aspect for future needs. How do you use data once, collect it once, and use it multiple times is what I'm referring to. During this stage, I encourage you to avoid dictating how the specs should be met. This can eliminate other viable and possibly more cost-effective centers or methods. The collaboration process will allow the consultant to design the how to get it done part of the intended objective and not just fulfill a cookie cutter request. So now that you understand the intended use of your data and you've spoken to your internal stakeholders, it's important to really involve the consultant. As mentioned in the previous slide, Involve the consultant as soon as possible. Involving the consultant sooner than later will increase the odds of satisfying the stakeholders and uh, satisfy all stakeholders and acquiring the correct and intended data is delivered. It's important to involve all stakeholders even within your organization, as I mentioned before, so that you understand their needs. There are times when one project can satisfy the needs of multiple stakeholders if the project is designed properly and early enough. So talk to your external, your internal stakeholders. See if they have use or need in, in combining efforts. By doing so, you can save time and money for your organization as a whole. 
Maybe you only require elevation data or contours, but another department or stakeholder may need imagery of the same area. So instead of handling the two needs independently, you can combine them into one project. So telling the consultant what your combined needs are will allow them to design a solution that will deliver the multiple data sets as one project, thus avoiding unnecessary costs and time. I really encourage all of you, too, to ask questions. Ask a lot of questions so that both you and the, the provider, the consultant, are confident that all aspects of your project are addressed and understood. Along with asking questions, asking questions, provide as much information as possible about your, your needs, about the project, what your intended use is. Tell the consultant what your intentions and expectations are of the data. What answers are you expecting from the data? Now, the status quo trap, what do I mean by that? That's really think out of the box. Don't ask for or do something just because that's how it's always been done. By doing so, it results in improper requests uh, and specifications and ultimately ends up with a poorly written designed RFP. I've seen standards requested that don't, aren't appropriate to specific data deliverable. And it also excludes more efficient and cost-effective technology. So in other words, are, are your requests relevant to what you're doing, what you need, or are they outdated? So avoid the status quo trap. Also, uh, don't be intimidated by the consultant. They're not going to judge you on your knowledge about remote sensing. You basically have other priorities and responsibilities other than spending time keeping up with the latest advancements in technology and methods. It's our job as a consultant to remain up to date on your behalf. So we're not expecting you to know all aspects of geospatial. So that's what we're here for. Some organizations deal with geospatial projects on a regular basis, so they're more up to speed. They're more knowledgeable. Others may periodically deal with geospatial projects. So we're there to help navigate depending on what your experience is with geospatial projects. So again, don't be intimidated. Time cost quality triangle. I want to point out that the term quality in this case is more of a question of tolerance to your project specifications. And they're really not meant to infer a lack of data quality. Data quality should always be expected and delivered regardless of what project deliverables and specifications you have requested or need. Even if you aren't familiar with the textbook concept of the time cost quality triangle, I think most of you manage this in your professional workday. It's important to maintain the three aspects of the triangle, but there are times when one aspect is compromised in order to compensate for the other two. Generally, this occurs due to improper planning or expectations or even factors that are out of your control. Collaborating with your consultant, though, will help my mitigate the variables that could affect those three aspects of the triangle. A key point when considering your project requirements and costs is to understand your schedule tolerances, as an example. Know where your hard deadlines are and where you have some flexibility, because unnecessarily restrictive deadlines can add cost and make a project more difficult to complete. Knowing your, your schedule tolerances and flexibility is important because you can communicate that to your provider. And they can design a schedule around that or a solution around that so that they're able to work with you and let you know where the, the risks are in the schedule or cost. As an example, with all restrictions aside, I personally prefer to know when you would need deliverables in your hands rather than giving me a deadline for the acquisition. This allows me to get what you want when you want it but it also provides me a wider window for scheduling resources. And that can also reduce schedule and costs. 
Now, obviously, in the real world, everything is due yesterday, but the key point here is I'm trying to make is keep your consultant informed as much as possible. Another concern for most geospatial providers is not allowing enough time or adequate time for the response to be developed. It's important not only to get a response, but get an adequate response that answers all concerns of your project. Such conditions often result in incomplete or poorly prepared responses. So generally, I would expect up to a, for a, a multi-discipline project, a reasonable amount of time is, is three, four to six weeks of, of time for a reasonable response. Now, geospatial projects include a few more components in addition to the time cost quality concept. And what are these components? And how do they affect the time cost quality triangle? Well, I would add accuracy, precision, and resolution. Accuracy is a conformity with, with truth. So basically, imagine a target with a bullseye with three holes. Accuracy would be how close those holes are to the bullseye. And what is the confidence level in the measurement of those holes? Because the greater the accuracy, the greater the cost, it is important to discuss with your consultant your accuracy tolerances. What you're asking for in accuracy may be more than what, what's needed for your project. So it's really important to discuss that in detail. Then the consultant can design a solution that's within those acceptable tolerances and they'll be able to provide you the most cost-effective solution possible. Now, precision doesn't have as much impact, but imagine the same target. Precision would, is how close together those three shots are on the target. Per precision is basically the degree of perfection needed for your project. Now, resolution does have a, a, an impact on cost and schedule as well. Pixel resolution is also known as ground sampling distance. So how far can you zoom in and keep the image integrity and clarity? So the same factors that affect accuracy also affect resolution. Your tolerance levels with regards to pixel resolution will determine if the project is flown, let's say, at a higher or lower altitude. It also depends on the amount of ground control and also the production resources and effort that will be required. All of these have an effect on cost and schedule. There are many other project-specific variables not discussed today, so it's important to initiate discussions with the consultant. Those variables can, can affect the price as well as schedule. For example, what is, can you access the area? Is it easy to access? How much ground control do you need? Those type of variables, variables will, will come into, into play. Now, if you're not familiar, with different standards, um, you can also follow a variety of mapping standards that are outlined, that outline conformance criteria such as accuracy, labeling, and quality checks, and assurance practices. Again, it's important to discuss these with the consultant. Make sure the proper standard you choose is appropriate to your intended use. Now, some of the mapping standards that are common for example, you have National Map Accuracy Standards, NMAS. Now, these standards apply more to fixed-scale paper maps and does not translate to the digital world. Then you also have, as a reference, if you needed to reference American Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, or ASPRS. ASPRS sets standards for digital maps with a variable scale and address the root mean square error. error which averages a set of squared differences between data sets, coordinates, values, and coordinate values from independent sources of higher accuracy for identical points. So again, it depends on what your tolerances are and what standard you end up using. Then you also have national standard for spatial data accuracy. It's very similar to ASPR standards with some variations. But for today's purpose, I'm only highlighting the types of standards and recommend a more thorough evaluation to determine whether or not the use of these standards applies to you or appropriate to your project. You also have industry-specific standards like uh, FEMA, 
USACE, USGS. Um, a lot, even individual states have their own standards. A lot of them will, will pull from industry accept, wide accepted standards like ASPRS or NSFDA. Now, price considerations. Geospatial projects are not a commodity and typically have specific variables that will affect price, as I mentioned earlier. You'll get a more accurate and realistic price if you consider each project individually rather than try to extrapolate a price based on a project that you've done similarly in the past. Some of these variables, as I mentioned before, are the project elevation or altitude. That can affect how it's flown. Uh, as I said before, access to the, to the area for ground control. So if you need a lot of ground control and the area is remote, it's going to require more resources and time to set that ground control. Is the uh, project area that you want collected, is it contiguous or spread out? Those will dramatically affect the price. Or is it linear or is it a curvy area? So bringing all those to the table and discussions with your consultant will help get a more accurate price. So that's why it's important to consider every project area as an individual project. It's easy to inadvertently come up with your own estimated cost, which could be artificially high if you take a price from a previous project and multiply it or try to apply it to a new project. Now, the low bid procurement method is when a contract is awarded to the lowest responsible bidder. Now, the value of any geographic data set depends less on cost and more on its fitness for a particular purpose or intended use. This process has been favored because it's a simple and easy procurement process. You select the cheapest bid. It was meant to avoid favoritism, particularly when federal, state, or local government funding was involved. It was also meant to keep costs as low as possible but it had an unintended consequence, and that the consequence resulted in needs not always being met. The problem with the low bid process is that it does not allow you to balance qualifications, technical approach, and price. It doesn't allow for flexibility when awarding a contract. And flexibility will allow you to get the, the best value at the best cost. The terms cheap is expensive or you get what you pay for come to my mind. Selecting cheap may result in schedule delays, cost overruns due to the need to acquire additional data, and also could result in sacrificed quality. I know of companies who were selected using low bid procurement that would shift the task of quality control to the client. Basically what would happen is the data would be collected to some minimal quality standards, delivered to the customer and they would fix whatever the customer would, would discover. And what that does is that puts the additional labor and resources onto the client or the customer to do proper QAQC of the data. Also the low bid procurement process could re result in a less than complete and expected deliverable because there wasn't enough time or discussion in what was really intended of the data. Now the trend is to use an alternative procurement process such as qualification-based selection or QBS. QBS procurement process is an objective, flexible, and fair process that can assist in selecting a geospatial firm, which also considers their experience and their credentials and their capabilities. The cost of service is not considered initially in this process but only until after the most qualified firms are identified. The cost quotation itself is often requested, but not necessarily has to be delivered in a sealed separate envelope. And it's generally not open until after qualified firms are ranked in order or a preference based on their grading, whatever the grading parameters you may set for yourself. When price quotes are opened, however, there can be a wide discrepancy among the quotes. So it's important to, to um, decide ahead of time what, um, 
what percentage of difference you want to uh, accept. Uh, price breaks. Another consideration when working with geospatial consultants is the size of the project, where the to determine where the price breaks would come into effect. So in other words, larger projects have a lower price per unit. So it's it's important not to multiply an estimate from a smaller project area and apply it to a larger project. As I mentioned before, that will give you an artificially high price or at times a low price. So discuss where price points are with your consultant. Now selecting a geospatial firm. There are some things here that you should consider. You should consider the capabilities of a geospatial firm and determine if they can meet all or some of your project needs. Uh, for example, are they a full service company that can provide services ranging from mission planning and acquisition to production and mapping? Or perhaps they offer other do they offer other associated services such as GIS enterprise development, scanning, digitizing services, or data hosting web services? Now, depending on the complexity and scope of your project, you may decide to consider a firm that can handle all aspects of your geospatial project. Or you may decide to sub to multiple companies. Now, some companies will provide partial services, and you will have to sub out to different companies. Sometimes you may decide to sub to multiple companies for your own internal reasons. Working with one firm is easier to manage and could potentially offer price breaks because they can spread fixed costs over the entire project. They can also oversee all details of the project in its entirety, which helps mitigate some of the risk and make sure that everything is, is seamless. It's also important to verify they have sufficient experience and a proven track record performing the services specific to your project. Some options for qualifying a company are to consider how long they've been in business. Do they employ the latest technology? Do they operate multiple centers? Do they have testimonials or referrals from previous clients? These all help in identifying the right provider for your project and for your organization. Just like I would not select a company solely based on one particular criteria, I would not eliminate a company on only one particular criteria as well. Now, obviously, they must satisfy the basic qualifications for your project, but I recommend in addition that you evaluate a company as a whole, not just their capabilities and experience. I would also caution you not to rule out a provider due to their location, because most geospatial firms migrate their resources where needed. For example, uh, we w we're located in the Midwest, but our planes are constantly transitioning to locations all across North America. So, so don't necessarily rule out a company based on their, their, their headquartered. Now, certifications associations, it's not a main criteria, but it's something to also consider. Do they have ASPRS certified photogrammetrists? How many GIS professionals do they have? That could determine or give some light or insight into how, if, how they're going to be able to accomplish your project. Do they have available licensed surveyors that can oversee and sign off on projects? Whether it's in-house or as partners, those may be criteria that are important to you. So it's really up to you to determine what's important to you, but these guidelines will at least give you some thought in, in asking the questions necessary to find out if they're qualified enough for you and your project. Now responsiveness is also important. Do they respond to your requests and questions in a timely manner? I think you should expect a certain level of urgency from a, a, a geospatial consultant regardless of whether you have a contract, awarded contract, or project with them. Now, obviously, they'll need to prioritize your request, but ultimately, they should respond appropriately. And I think a good geospatial firm should treat a small project just as important as a big project. So those are other criteria that may not affect the quality of the, the data, but it will show you, give you some insight into how well you're going to be able to work with them or deal with them if there are problems or if you need to communicate changes or issues. Those are all important. Now, some other 
special de designators um, I would consider. Are they veteran owned? Are they disadvantaged, minority owned, small business, women, a woman owned business? Those designators have some effect on, on the type of project that you get awarded, particularly if there's federal funding involved or state funding. Those state and federal funded projects have a lot of set-asides that have to go to some uh, uh, related type um, company that might meet those special designators. Now, you don't need those for your private projects, but uh, it's something to also consider when looking at a geospatial fund and knowing what um, what the funding, where the funding is coming from, and what your customers may request of you. Now, another thing, terminology. Now, I didn't want to get too involved in terminology in this presentation, but it's important to be familiar with some terminology. For example, what's the difference between a DSM, DTM, a DEM? relative accuracy or absolute accuracy. So these things are, are somewhat important. So when you're talking with your consultant, you're talking similar language. Now there's a variety of resources out there that you can do some due diligence and research to better understand these terminologies. Uh, we pulled some from ASPRS and put them on our website, which the link is provided here. But there's multiple places where you, you can learn the web uh, the terminology. So you don't need to uh, know every piece of terminology, but just be somewhat familiar. If you're talking with a consultant and you don't understand a term or what it really means, question them on it. Ask them so that you understand, because that's going to make a better, more productive uh, discussion and collaboration process. Uh, some of the different standards out there that I mentioned before, uh, USGS accuracy standards, we provided a link there. Um, NMSA standards, there's a link. So I'd encourage you all to, if you're not familiar, go research these sites and better understand the, the standards and determine if they apply to your project or if you want to use your own specific standards. But again, talking with a geospatial consultant, whether it's internal, external, or with a firm or independent consultant, it's important to really discuss those with him. And then ASPRS uh, is a good, good resource um, to also research. So I would encourage you, as you have time, to start looking at those various um, uh, resources. Now, I know this is a short presentation, but like I said, the intent was to encourage uh, the collaboration process, give you some food for thought, some criteria on deciding how and who to use, um, and just to kind of really get you thinking out of the box. Now, because it's a, a short presentation, I'm sure I haven't addressed all your concerns today. So if I haven't, I encourage you to ask questions here, or at a later date, contact a geospatial consultant, whether it's us or somebody else. And, and ask those questions. And then we can, as a consultant, we can work you through the process, discuss specific questions, or even a, a project scenario. We'd encourage you to just open dialogue and communication with, with someone in the industry that may be able to answer those questions for you. Now again, that's, that concludes my presentation. And I encourage questions. I encourage follow-on. I encourage you to communicate and discuss with a geospatial consultant, and I thank you for your time. And I'd like to pass this over to Joshua so we can maybe answer some of these questions that are online today. Thanks. Thanks, Roy. That was a very informative and a useful presentation. We appreciate your taking the time to prepare that material and, and, and share it with our group here today. Um, so uh, as Roy mentioned, you can feel free to um, Send in your questions at any time. Uh, you can use the question pane as part of the GoToWebinar window. So any technical or uh, maybe uh, tactical uh, questions that might have been spurred during the presentation, feel free to chime in with those at any moment. One other note I'll make is that 
we will be providing a link to the slides, the links that were just referenced uh, at the end of the presentation, and a video version of this presentation um, after the fact, within about a week or so, uh, to your email that you provided when you signed up. So you'll be able to review all this material or share it with others at that time. Okay, Roy, so um, let's start out with a first question here, which is, as far as the different um, types of geospatial data that are out there, I mean, aerial services, we work with YR and ortho imagery, and we do some software-oriented work as well, and terrain data, and all this kind of thing. Uh, is there any particular type of data that's more complicated to have this collaboration and, and scoping tasks uh, to, to accomplish, or are they all kind of equal, or can you tell us a little bit about the, um, the connections between those, or, or variance between those different types sure. of um, collaboration projects? Yeah, I, I think it's not necessarily one particular technology that is more complicated than other, at least for what the derived products are. They may be for the production process or for the, the provider, but as a user or data user or owner of the data, it's really, it's really up to, I wouldn't lock into a specific technology. It's really up to deciding what you're trying to get out of it to determine what technology that could be. And the most difficult part is really combining different technologies or sensors together because there are some complications there in making sure that the data sets match, they're seamless. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say one is more complicated than the other. It's really up to your experience. Um, if they're all fairly unfamiliar to some degree, then you know the, it's, it's time to start asking questions on all sensors and let the geospatial consultant kind of help guide you through that to determine what particular data set or technology is used. So I think I hope I answered that to some degree. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. OK, so our next question is in regards to, I guess you had that slide a few slides ago where you were talking about uh, what to look for in a geospatial firm. But even before you can maybe get to the point where you're making decisions about which direction you want to go, can you give some offerings to you know, just identifying you know, your, even your short list of who you want to send an inquiry to or who would you contact? Um, how, how do you how do you narrow that down to find the best grouping of consultants slash firms that can help you with this process? I mean, I could see um, uh, uh, going to an event and going to a trade show, and you might walk through, and there's a half a dozen or a dozen different firms or consultants that do this kind of thing. How do you narrow down which one to talk to? Is there any kind of quick quick hits things you should look for uh, right off the bat? Um, well, it, it's just like anything that if you were to go out and purchase something and you weren't real familiar with who to reach out to, um, you just want to cast a wide net. Uh, it comes down to just asking questions because you're not committing to any one particular uh, firm. So if I walked into a conference center and there were six different firms, I'd talk to all six different firms and then just start nailing them down based on um, everything from do they have the capabilities? Because asking questions doesn't commit you to anything. So you ask questions until you get a satisfied answer. And until you feel that you've identified a few that you're comfortable not only from a capability a point of view of delivering your what you need, but also there is some, some uh, um, I don't want to say personality involved, but are you comfortable wor working with them? Can you just talk to them or they you know you want to be able to get along with the firm that you're working with because it's no longer just deliver data pass it over and that's it it's more relation based to some degree not completely but underneath the the, the priority of your project there it can be a relation based depending on if your job is your project is a big job and it's going to take some time and there's going to be a lot of communication back and forth you want to get you want to feel comfortable with them if it's just a small project where you go out, you know, collect some data real quick, and it's a very simple product, you deliver it, well, I guess it doesn't really matter in the respect of whether or not you feel comfortable and you're talking with them and getting along with them. It's, that's not as important. So 
I would say just ask questions. Um, even ask around in your own industry who have who have they used or do they have any references? So just like anything, ask questions and uh, ask around. Um, do some research on the web. Um, you know, just until you've identified somebody, that's what I would recommend. We have a related question that came in here, Roy, um, asking, are there any national organizations that might help you, help you find qualified firms? I mean, you talked about ASPRS and some of these standards-based organizations. Are there any associations or, or um, organizations that could help in that regard? Uh, yeah, Josh, I'll probably let you, because as the marketing director, you really get involved in these. But um, there, there are lots of organizations and associations out there, anywhere from state associations and organizations to um, national organizations. Um, sure, sure. So yeah, I guess um, I, I think you're referencing the fact that he, at least here in Iowa, we're, you know, as, as Roy noted, we're based in the Midwest. We have our statewide national, uh, or sorry, uh, Iowa Geographic Information Council uh, in the state. That's one organization that might, you, you, most states have something like that, a GIS uh, coalition that uh, might be able to help reference some firms that have done work for others within them, like uh, Roy was saying, just asking questions of colleagues. Um, we also at Aero Services are involved with MAPS, um, which is a national organization of firms like us that do remote sensing. Uh, and uh, there's quite a few firms involved there that will give you a nice long list of, of potential firms to consider uh, as well uh, that, that, that aspire to, to um, provide quality work like, like we do. What else, Ryan? Any others that I'm forgetting right now? Um, no, I, I, it all depends on where you're based. For example, I'm, head, I'm located in Maryland, even though our office is in Iowa. I, there's organizations here, Maryland State um, um, associations that, that I belong to that also could help you. But if you're in your own state, a different state, um, I would encourage you to reach out to some of them. and. I can I can provide a list. I can pull someone uh, some organizations uh, for you if I know what where you're located and try to help you there. But um, it's really based on on um, you know their state and, and national organizations. Okay, right. So another question here is in regards to you know kind of what's the hardest question? What are some of the hardest uh, questions that you may have gotten from clients that? Um, that maybe uh, you didn't address during the, the talk. You know, what are some of the what are some of the things that come up from time to time with your clients that are that are um, the, the real hard ones? That you had to go back and talk to the talk to all the photographers back at the office. <laughs> well, um, I can't recall one particular question that really came up that I have to go back and consult with the team. But usually, when you start getting down to the really um, the high, uh, the how do I want to say it? Those projects that have very low tolerances and a degree of high accuracy, um, those I really need to sit down with the the team and discuss to make sure that uh, the sensors have the capability of meeting those. Because um, sometimes it depends on the the environment that the project is being collected in, the geographic environment. Um, so that's probably one of the ones that really have to sit back and, and really discuss to make sure that um, those accuracies uh, and specifications are met. Um, if there are loose accuracies and specifications, it's not so difficult to say, yeah, we can do that. So that's really okay. about it. Okay, great, thanks. So um, I, I think we're wrapping up on the questions here, but I have one more uh, with regards to just how we get in touch with you, Roy. You, you, you mentioned that you'd be willing to chat with anybody about uh, questions from this event, of course, and uh, as well as any project or any of stuff, if there was anyone that would like to collaborate. Um, but we didn't see any of your contact information. Can you provide that? Uh, yeah, I will. And I apologize for not having that on the slide. Um, my contact information is on our website at um, www.aerialservicesinc.com. But my email is rhill 
at aerialservicesinc.com com, or my office number is 240-347-7000. And we'll be sure to include uh, contact information, not only for me, but for our organization on the, the slides when they're released, um, when, when, when we send those out. Sure, and I, I just added those to the chat uh, window as well for anybody that's trying to jot those down. You can copy and paste them right out of there. Okay, great. Well, if there's no more questions, uh, Roy, I think we'll wrap it up from there. Uh, I want to, again, thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, do not forget to fill out the survey as you exit today. Uh, it will pop up in a window when you when you close the webinar window. Um, and uh, for my colleagues here, Roy Hill, as well as Amy Vosper, who has been helping with the production side of today's webinar, we want to thank you for being here, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at, uh, at our next webinar next month. Thanks again. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye.